Where are my children this morning? One. We got one. We got two. All right. We got some now. Great. Um, unbeknownst to you, perhaps, the last three or four weeks, we've been having a series of lessons out front about family and ministry. And so we talked about what the function of a family was, uh, which was to uh, show God's love to each other. We talked the second week about wives and mothers and women and what their responsibility in the family was in the home. And then last week, we talked about men and fathers and their responsibility in the home, uh, which brings us to children. So this week, I'm talking to you children of what your responsibility is at home in the family. Okay, so I hope that it's helpful. Um, and we'll have some interaction and some engagement today, uh, asking you some questions, since we don't often interact out here up, up front during our lessons. Um, the first point, does everyone have an outline? All the children have an outline? You don't? Where's the outlines? Every child needs an outline. So if you're an adult and you have one, okay. Everyone now have an outline. If you don't have an outline, raise your hand. Tall. Which one here? He's got one. Okay. Do you need a pencil or something? That's what we're looking for? We need pencils or pens. I'm sorry, I don't have these things handy out front all the time. Here's a pen. I think there's a basket in the back there. I know these are all already available in the children's class in the back. By the way, if I could just take the time to thank the children's teachers in the back, we, we don't do that enough. And um, the children learn a, a lot of doctrine back there that you don't learn typically in churches, which are normally glorified babysitting places. And, um, and, and yet we learn, we learn doctrine, even the, the babies and things back there, they're going through Bible stories. And, and then in the, the, the big kids class in the back, the young ambassadors class, they're learning doctrine that I could teach out here that's harder than out here sometimes. And they're learning, which is great because uh, they need to. Uh, we need to. Um, we say, why then do we have a separate children's class? Um, and there's really not a very good reason. Uh, the, the main reasons I tell the children's teachers are, are one is that we need a place to put young people, babies and children so they don't distract their parents. Now, this is primarily for the babies. When babies are distracting their parents, they can't learn out here. This is a problem for their edification. So we have a place that, you know, throw your babies in the back and, and then, then you can, can you come and learn in peace. You know, and so this is a, a, a benefit. It, it becomes less of a, of a need for when you grow up. When you're in the big kids class, you're less of a distraction for your parents. So um, the second thing is to actually communicate doctrine to you, to teach you what the Bible says, um, and hopefully in a way that maybe is a little slower than how I speak and maybe uh, less dry. So uh, hopefully it's, it's, it's to your, your understanding. But meanwhile, uh, th thank you, children's teachers, for doing that. So no doubt you're a lot better than I am in experience at doing this. But uh, this lesson is to the children this morning. Children, you are an important part of your family. I don't know if you've ever been told that, but you are. Without you, there is no family. You understand that? Without you guys, it's just mom and dad, which is a marriage. So you children make the family a family. Do you get that? That's how important you are. And in the Bible, it speaks to you. Did you know that? The Bible's not just for adults and grown-ups. It speaks to children. In fact, there's a couple of verses we'll talk about later where it says children, and then it's like talking to you. And then it, it tells you what to do. Okay? Um, in the Bible, God teaches parents, of course, and churches to love their children. So that's some, some good ammunition for you to have right there. Uh, just take these verses in point number two, Titus 2, 4, where it tells the women to love their children. And Colossians 3, 21, where it tells the, the fathers not to provoke their children to anger. And Ephesians 6, not to provoke your children to wrath, not to discourage them. That's very useful verses for as children when you're at home dealing with your parents. Okay, because uh, God tells them instructions on how they're supposed to parent you. Okay, in the Bible, children are called a heritage, a light, a blessing, a reward, a sign, a wonder, a fruit, a life. Um, did you know that? Did you guys know you're a heritage? Do you know what a heritage is? Yes. You know what a heritage is? No? You're shaking your head. That's, that's good. Good church behavior. Shake your head. <laughs> a, a heritage... Uh, is what you receive passed down to you from someone else. Like if someone's leaving and they leave something behind to remember them by or to give you in remembrance or uh, as a part of them, that's what an inheritance is or a heritage. And the Bible says children are a heritage, which means that you are what's been passed down from your parents and your parents' parents and your parents' parents' parents. Does any of the children here know their great, 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 great grandpa? Really? No. Great, 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 great grandpa. You know? No. 
<laughs> I see hands falling just because you like stretching, right? <laughs> I don't know my great, 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 great grandpa. Maybe, maybe 30 or 40 times back, uh, we're all, we all got the same one. You know who he is, right? Our great, 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 grandpa is uh, is who is is adam right yeah uh, or noah depending on how many greats i had in there we all have the same one so we're all kind of this big happy human family but um uh the bible says children are our heritage which means that you you are what's left from those people you're it and when we're gone you'll be here too so you see you are the heritage and the bible says you are a reward Again, these, I'm giving you good stuff here. I mean, when you're at home with your parents, and they're like, you know, go clean your room. You're like, I'm the heritage here. I'm a reward. This is what you say. I'm a blessing. I'm the life. I'm, I'm a wonder. And then your parents laugh at you like they're doing right now. But th- at least you have Bible to support what you're saying. Anyway, um, you have a lot of life ahead of you because you're all young. Uh, what, how old are we? How old are you? Ten. Ten? Nine? Eight. And we're going down. We got a seven? <laughs> seven. Six? Hi, we got a five-year-old out here. Are you seven? No five-year-olds? Four? You're five? All right. Wait, man, that's amazing. Uh, I didn't find that. Uh, you got a, life, a lot of life ahead of, of you. You know that. How many years think you have ahead of you? A hundred. A hundred. You to live to a hundred. Anybody else here think you're going to live to a hundred? Everybody's raising their hand. Jim does. Jim's going to live to a hundred. Talk to him about that. So Psalm 90, verse 10, the Bible teaches, David says in Psalms to teach us to number our days. David prayed that he would think about his future and know how long his life would be. And did you know how long he thought his life would be? Psalm 90, verse 10 says that he would be three score and 10, which is the way of saying 70 years old. And then if you're strong, maybe 80. And that's kind of what he was planning for. Right? Is anybody here over 80? Jim, once again. That's, you start singing, I'll fly away, Jim. That's Psalm 90, verse 10 and 11. But, uh, you know, everything after that is a blessing, and you've learned that by now. Sure. Yes, sir. So 70 or 80 years. So it doesn't even say 100, even though, you know, that's possible and people do that. And, and David's saying, I'm going to plan my life for 70 or 80 years. Um, nobody is, is 70 years old. In fact, we had one, you're 10, right? Anybody else 10? 11? 11? 10? Anybody 12? Yeah, 12? 13? You're not a child anymore after 13, right? Is that how it is? Webster. Webster doesn't say so. If you look at Webster in the dictionary under the word adult, um, you know what the definition of an adult is under the Webster's dictionary? It's someone who's a full size or mature, and then it says between 14 and 25. I'm like, well, that's interesting. So 14 and 25. Any 14 or 15 year olds? According to Webster, you're an adult. <laughs> there you go. That's, I'm giving you ammunition. This is good stuff here, you see. Meanwhile, 70, 80 years. And here's a question that's going to drive your parents mad. Do you think... Your parents are old. Yes or no? Yes. 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 <laughs> anybody, else, anybody else have old parents? Uh, yes, your parents are old. Okay, well, let me draw a timeline here for you. Okay? And it's not going to be a, a Bible timeline. It's going to be a timeline of your life. All right? Here's year zero. And that represents when you were a cell in your mother's womb. And then you have uh, 20 years old. There's no child here 20 year old, right? Good. 40 years old. 60 years old. I just told you that in Psalm 90, David says, teach us, Lord, to count our years. And he said, count them up to 70 or 80, right? 70 and 80, right? So this was how David thought he would die. He would die around 80 years old. And so he's going to plan his life. Right now, you're all five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Where's this on the timeline? You're over here, right? There's ten, nine, eight, seven. You're over here. This is you. Now you said my parents are old, right? You all said this, and I'm gonna guess here. All your parents are right here. Is that about right, parents? No. My- <laughs> no. No. Your parents are older than fifty. No, they're younger. Younger, right? They're younger, right? That's what I'm saying. Your parents are right here. My point is, look, this is old over here. Hey, be nine. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you're close to numbering your years, Nancy. I mean, no doubt you children are young. Here's your parents right here. In fact, look, I mean, this is even right here. I mean, this is 20s, 30s. That's young. What am I saying? You think my parents are old. They're done with their life. They're not. They had you in the prime of their life. Like, at, in the time of their life where it's like, I'm living my own life, and boop, there you go. Here you are, a baby, a child, right? This, this is interesting to think about, because as we talk about your life and how you're supposed to be a child and what you're supposed to do and grow up, this is what you're going to grow up 
to be. You're going to grow to be 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. And, and I remember when I was a child, I did have no perspective on what life would be. I mean, I thought it'd be great to be 13. You know, may, maybe uh, 18 or 17, I get my license or something, 16. You know, maybe 20. I'm 20, that's, that's old. If I'm 20, I'm a millionaire. Anybody else have this plan? When you're a 20-year-old, you got lots of money, right? I mean, you're rich, you're on your own. And all the adults are laughing. But as a child, this is what you think. Set, right? Am I wrong? Well, what's your plan for life? When are you going to get on your own? What, what, how old? I love the people in the front. Anybody else wants to join them up here? It's great. When are you going to get out on your own? I'm going to be a millionaire. Well, millionaire. At what age? Um, three. Uh, how long will it take you to become a millionaire, you think? I mean, if you don't get there by, by 25, you pretty much give up on that goal, right? <laughs> She's counting on, her, on one hand. She's counting. You ever had someone tell you you have a lot of potential? Yeah. Uh, that means you haven't done anything yet. That's what that means. <laughs> You have a lot of potential. That means there's much possibility. You know, everyone tell you that you have many possibilities in your life, right? Yeah, yeah. Your, your possibilities are endless. You know what that means? You've not done any of them. <laughs> That's what that means. Um, but what that is good is that you are young, which means you do have a lot of life to live. There's a lot of things you can do, right? The Bible says it's important that you know what the truth is so that you can learn and understand how to live your life in the Lord. That's what the Bible says. Does anyone know Jesus? Talk to the children here. Oh, you got one. No, no Jesus. What do you know about him, Elise? What do you know about him? He died on the cross, yeah. Anyone have a guess on how, what, what do you know about him? I know that he died on the cross and he rose again on the third day. That's right, and he rose again on the third day, which is important because if he just died, lots of people have died. In fact, everyone's died in history, except people who are alive. You've thought about that, right? Everyone before has died, except people who are alive. But he rose from the dead, he resurrected from the dead. Uh, so we know that about Christ. Anyone know how old Christ was when he died? Anybody? <laughs> was that a cheat? Was that what that was? 33, you're exactly right. 33. And on the timeline here, where's that at? He was almost old enough to have some kids. 33. Not very old. See, David said, number my days when I'm 70 and 80. And Jesus was only 33. Young guy. Right? In fact, uh, if you're 10 years old, that's only 20 years older than you are, that he was teaching and that he died on the cross. Do you, anybody uh, have a thought about when they will die? You ever, you ever thought about this? That you think about it all the time? No? Sometimes? Do you, do you know when you're going to die? Who was born after 2000? All you kids were born after 2000? Yeah. Uh, no, that's right. Yeah, no one's, there wouldn't be a kid at that point. would be 19 years old, yeah. 2000. 10? Anybody born before 2010? Oh. Yeah, there's a couple, yeah. So, you have 2000s here. If this timeline of your life is correct, how old will you be when you die? Basic oh, math. 42 million. No, that's not right at all. <laughs> yeah. If you were born in 2000, we'll see 2010, just because that's kind of the, an average. This will be 2090, right? Then, then, then David says, this is average. And then death happens. And you don't even know if that's guaranteed because Jesus died when he was 33, right? People die for all sorts of reasons. Maybe you'll die because of lack of food. Do you, do you buy your own groceries now? Anybody? Does any child buy their own groceries? You, you buy them? Close. Someone else does it for you. You have servants to do it. I, I see. Well, th that's amazing. Well, I, I'm really glad to hear that because we're talking about that today. If you don't buy your own groceries, how are you going to eat without your parents? You know, maybe you'll die soon of starvation over here. So it's a big worry. But um, when you die, does anyone know what happens? Anybody else except for Basil? <laughs> what happens when you die? Yeah. You go to heaven when you die? Some people go to heaven. Not everybody goes to heaven. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do, do you know what happens uh, before you go to heaven after you die? I know I'm being a little technical here. Yeah. Yep, yes, this is true. Um, well, that may be before you die, actually. You stop breathing and then you die. And then, yeah, it's, it's somewhere around there. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28 says that it's destined for man once to die and then to face judgment. Have you heard that before? In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, can you turn to 2 Corinthians 5? Everyone have their Bibles or do you? 
There should be some in the pews if you don't. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 10, Paul says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Actually, let me back up a verse where he says, I say that I am willing rather to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord. Let me say that again. Paul says, I'm willing to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Anybody want to do that now? Come up forward. <laughs> absent from the body. So you're not going to be in your body anymore. I'm going to take you out of your body. I'll just knock you out and you'll die right now. <laughs> and you're present with the Lord, however. And verse 9 says, uh, we labor that we may be accepted of God, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to he hath done, whether it be good or bad. After you die, you'll face Jesus, and you'll see him, just like we sang the song, what a day that'll be, we'll see him face to face. And he will look at your life, he'll judge you based on what you've done in your body, good or bad. This is why, as we've heard twice already from the children, and what an amazing thing it is that you guys know this, at such a young age, and needful, is that if you trust that Christ died for your sins, when you see Jesus, and he's going to judge for sins, and he says, oh, I died for your sins, then he can let you into heaven. He can give you life and give you blessings and give you glory because he's died for your sins and he rose from the dead. What happens if you don't trust that Jesus died for your sins and you die and you see Jesus at the judgment? Yeah. Look at 2 Thessalonians. You don't have an answer? Oh, okay. 2 Thessalonians. That happens a lot. It's all right. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. I'll show you what happens to those who do not know God when they die. They face a judgment of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the judge. In 2 Thessalonians 1, he says, um, verse 7, To you that are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. If you don't obey the gospel, trust Jesus Christ's death on the cross, his resurrection, don't trust him to save you, um, he comes back in flaming fire and burns you up for eternity because you've resisted his salvation and because your sins deserve punishment. That's what happens after you die. And this is significant because I know you've talked a lot about the gospel back in your, in your class, back in the kids' class, but it's important you realize that it's not just something that we believe in order to join the church or something. To be a Christian, I learned this lesson at Sunday school, and that's it. It's because your life, one day, your parents won't be here, I won't be here, and you'll be left, and you'll die, and you'll face Jesus. And if you don't know what happens after you die, or don't know what's going to happen with your sins, you're going to be in some trouble, right? And so that you trust Jesus and trust the Lord, you'll be able then to experience when you die glory, as Ellie pointed out, heaven, glory. The opposite of heaven is not glory. You know what glory is. Is anybody bored? Oh, was that a hand? No? We're all sinners, right? You know Romans 3? You memorize in Romans 3 back there? Romans 3, 10, there's none righteous, no, not one. We're all sinners. What kind of sins are sins? Any examples of sins? Yeah. What's a sin? Lying. Lying, lying is a sin, yeah. Another sin? Anybody else have a... Stealing, yeah. These are the easy ones, lying and stealing. Um, did you know that boredom is a sin? <gasps> what? <You> ever, <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm sitting in church all the time. <laughs> yeah. Boredom is a sin. And you know why it's a sin, and here's why. It's because um, the purpose of life, now parents, I prick their ears. The purpose of life is to know the glory of God. And God's glory means that you can enjoy things forever. That's what that means. You have righteousness and peace and joy forever. That's the glory of God. And so can you be bored and enjoy what you're doing at the same time? In fact, you're bored because you don't enjoy what you're doing, right? I don't enjoy this. I'm uninterested. I'm bored, right? Well, that's because you don't know the joy of the Lord at that moment or forever, and thus you're bored. You see, so if you're, if you're standing for Jesus in the judgment after you die, you stand there and he's going through your sins, and you're like, I'm bored. What's he do? He's like, well, if you don't want to be here. Whoops. You ever had that told to you? If you're bored, you don't have to be here, right? Well, you're the judgment seat of Christ. You're going, wait a minute. Where else can I go? Not heaven, right? Heaven is glory, is where you have joy forever, and hell is where there's no joy forever. In fact, people have said, theologians have said that hell is actually uh, boredom. It's one of the ways you describe hell, and that's why it's hell, is it's boring. 
Um, people don't have this idea they think hell is where the fun people go and then the heavens where the boring people go. Well, it's opposite, you see. Because God's glory is where you have joy forever and hell is where you do not enjoy anything forever. Boredom, right? So boredom is a sin, especially when God has given you life and a brain and food and the air and the trees and knowledge and wisdom and you go, not interested, right? Isn't that a sin? Not interested. Yeah. And so I mean, I I'm trying to make it real to you that sin is a lot of your life and you need Jesus to die for your sins and need his grace in order to have and know his glory forever, right? You need his salvation and children can be saved. Um, are you children saved today? Yeah. Do you trust Jesus to die on the cross for your sins because you want to know his glory. You don't want to be bored for eternity. You don't want to be uh, unrighteous for eternity. You want to know the joy of the Lord. Do you want to know peace and love? Yeah. In fact, th that meaning of life, we talk about the glory of God, the love and joy. This is what everyone, not only you, but everyone in the church is trying to have through their life. That's the purpose of life, to know the glory of God. Otherwise, you live a life of boredom, no love, no joy, no peace. Who wants that life, right? A lot of people will say, well, this is why you should really be happy that you're a child. Anyone told you this? Have fun while you're a child, because what happens when you're not a child anymore? Right? Well, no, you're going to be an adult. That's boring being an adult. I, 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 I've always believed that it's not. I, I've really enjoyed being an adult. I don't know if any adults here say amen to that or not. I've really enjoyed being an adult over a child. Do, do any adults here remember being a child? Hands raised. Yeah, so look around. So they all remember this. Um, is any adult here think that they know more as a child than they do now? Is any adult, do they have more money as a child as they do now? Did you have more freedom as a child as you do now? Wow. Wow. <laughs> well, well, this lesson's for you, too. <laughs> so you can know the joy of the Lord. I have much more freedom than I was a child. I remember I had to go to bed at a certain time. I could only eat certain things. I could go certain places. I could only uh, uh, watch certain things. I could only read certain things. I had very much limitation on my life. Now I could do anything that I want. Anything I want. Now, you can do anything you want as a child, too, right? But what happens? You starve very quickly because they'll kick you out of the house and then you don't eat, right? That's the issue. And so um, the, the instruction for children is to obey your parents, right? This is the instruction. Children need to know how to be saved, how to learn and understand the scripture, and how to take the responsibility that the Lord's given you. Um, do you know what you want to be when you grow up? I, I love the panel up here. I love this. They're, they're, they're creating my illustrations perfectly. What do you want to be when you grow up? Uh, I'm sorry, what? An artist. I did too, yeah. A baker? Oh, that's a challenging one these days. Uh, any, anyone else? Anyone, is there anyone else out there? I, I can't see any hands. Oh, yes. What do you want to be when you grow up? A diver. Like a deep sea diver or like off the springboard? Both. Yeah? I want to be a firefighter. To fight fires? Unicorn artist. Oh, that's what she's going to be. So you're going to... Oh, you're going to, a niche, I see, specialization, okay. A unicorn artist, right. Uh, I wanted to be a uh, football player when I was a child. Whoa. Anybody, want, what do you want to be when you grow up? A vegetarian? Oh, a veterinarian. <laughs> gotcha, a veterinarian. I was like, that's easy, a vegetarian, you just stop eating meat. A veterinarian, working with animals, animal doctor, yeah. That's a good one. That's a good one. So we know who's going to have the money in about 30 years from now, don't we? <laughs> All the adults are like, yep, we know that. Yeah. I, I wanted to be a professional football player, and I worshipped it. I had on my wall um, 32 symbols, one for every team of the National Football League. I had memorized the rosters of at least half of them. Uh, I wanted to be a football player, and to be a football player, I had to know everyone that played football. That's how it was. Um, and then I broke my leg. My dreams were shattered. Right. And yours will be, too, when you learn unicorns don't exist. Uh, that's, that's okay. Uh, that, that's okay. Meanwhile, they do exist in the Bible. A unicorn does. Uh, a single horned animal. <laughs> Meanwhile, I didn't hear anyone, and I played a little trick on you, because I asked you what you want to be, and you get this question asked a lot of time when you're a kid, and you always tell people your job, right? I want to be a veterinarian, I want to be an artist, right? I didn't hear anyone say I wanted to be godly when I grow up. Whoops, gotcha. <laughs> you're in church. <laughs> didn't get the right answer. And nobody said they wanted to be a preacher. I don't know why that is. 
You know, when I was a kid, I never said I wanted to be a preacher. In fact, I even grew up as a teenager. I was around this age here. And I said I did not want to be a preacher because I didn't think I understood enough. I didn't think I was good enough. I didn't think that I should be saying things that I didn't quite understand. So I didn't want to be one at all. Here I am. I don't know how I got here, but by God's grace. Yes. Oh, well, see, now you got the right answer. See, now you're on the right mind. And so no one said they, they wanted to be godly. In 1 Timothy 4, verse 6, it says godliness profits in this life and the next. And so if you're looking for eternal profit, godliness is something you ought to be. In 1 Timothy 4, um, in 1 Timothy 6, rather, it says being content is great gain. But no one said they wanted to make a lot of money. I didn't hear, did any child want to make a lot of money when they grow up? Yeah, a few of you, as, as an artist. This is great. Um, and so... Uh, Making money, in 1 Timothy 6, verse 6, it says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. The love of money is the root of all evil. And so you'll learn as you grow up that money is an important thing, but according to the scripture, um, it doesn't make you happy. It doesn't make you content. And so you can have all the money in the world and be the best unicorn artist in the world. And you may not be happy. You may not be content. In fact, it's a real thing. You talk to rich people, you talk to Bill Gates and talk to these guys and say, are you happy? And they stop and have to think about it. Because they have all the money in the world, and yet they... They, they don't, they've learned a lesson. It doesn't really make you happy, right? And so when I ask what you want to be, uh, what's more important than money or even your job, which may change many times. Any adults here are what they wanted to be when they grew up? Some are. It's, it's a thing. Some are not. Jim is old. That, that's what you want to be when you, grew, when you were younger, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, some people, they pursue what they wanted to do and they become that. Really? Congratulations. 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 But the rest, no one else. What's that, one out of a hundred? Yeah, you are what you wanted to be when you grew up. Which is what, a nurse? Yeah, yep. It happens and it's possible. And so you want to do something with your life, you can spend the work and effort and, and time to do it and you can be that. Um, but for many people, it doesn't happen and your minds will change. Over the next 10, 20, 30 years, your minds will change, your opportunities will change, and you may not be what you're thinking now. In fact, you may learn things that you do not know now. You realize that, right? Your, your whole mind about life will change. In 15 or 20 years, many of you will be married with children. You're all going, nope, nope. It might happen. 20 years from now, you'll be 30, 40. Remember I said your parents are here, right? 20 years, that's you in 20 years. Look at your parents. They're married with children. Why won't you be one? I read a, a survey the other day. They were surveying uh, younger generations. And you all, your children here, you're all in a generation called Generation Z. Do you know that? You, you ever heard of the millennials? No, you've never heard of this. You're in a generation called Generation Z. That's what they've labeled you, Generation Z. And they say about Generation Z that um, when they ask what is most important to your identity, it used to be for previous generations, not older people, I mean children, previous generations, they would say that, you know, my family and uh, my faith identify me most, and then other things follow. But in Generation Z, for whatever reason, children are now saying that, it's my vocation and my career that identify me most, above family, right? We'll talk more about this in the next couple of weeks, parents. But I mean, that's what they say. And, and it's because they don't see the importance of family or scripture. And so the lesson I'm trying to communicate to you today is that it's very important to understand who your family is and what your job is in the family and what the Bible says about who you're supposed to be when you grow up, which is a godly person, okay, to walk in godliness. And so... Um, where does the Bible speak about you? I mentioned this earlier. The Bible addresses you specifically. Does anyone know the couple places in Paul's epistles where it speaks to children? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Ephesians 6. Are you part of the group that memorized the entire book of Ephesians? Nice. Ephesians 6, uh, verse 1, right? Look at Ephesians 6, verse 1. In Ephesians 6... Ephesians chapter 6, in verse 1. God speaks to you in the Bible, like to you as children. We, we dealt before the last two weeks with where the Bible speaks to your mothers and to your fathers. And that's in the previous verses. And that's why we haven't you say not here this week, because it's talking to you. And we don't want to talk about you without you here. You see, so uh, we're, we're reading verse 1 where it says, Children. See, Paul is writing to the children in Ephesus. He says, Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. See what it says? It, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. When it says obey your parents in the Lord, it says in the Lord, that's not talking about your parents, that's talking about you. 
you need to obey your parents in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the reason why you obey your parents. Okay, you don't obey your parents because they're bigger than you, they're older than you, they buy you food. You obey your parents because the Lord, your Lord, your Savior says it's a right thing that you do that. And so you have to trust God that he says that's the right thing to do. You understand that? This is what your job is as children, to obey your parents. This is what God would have you do specifically. Your parents can't do this job. They're your parents. You're the only ones that can do it. Obey your parents and the Lord, for this is a right thing. Okay? Colossians 3 is the other place where it says the same thing. It says, children, obey your parents, for this is pleasing to the Lord. To the Lord. So again, you don't obey your parents because it makes them happy, even though that's a good reason. You obey your parents primarily because it makes God happy. It pleases Him. And remember, when you die, you're facing Him in judgment. You see, He's your Lord and Savior. So that's the reason why. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. I asked you what you wanted to be when you grow up. Did you know that God had already given you a job? Now, surely you know this. You've had this lesson many times in, in, in the back. Your vocation, your job as a Christian is, what is it called? It's a, yeah. Yeah, you're an ambassador. So you, you have this job, this vocation. And this is not just uh, for the adults or the grown-ups. It's also for the children. Everyone who is saved is part of the church is an ambassador. And Ephesians 4.1 says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord the beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. And the vocation is that you're an ambassador for the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Ephesians 5, verse 1, the next chapter. Ephesians 5, verse 1. It says, Be therefore followers of God as dear children. You see that? As dear children, follow God. And then Ephesians 6, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. You see what he said? In Ephesians 4, verse 1, Your job is to be an ambassador of the Lord. Ephesians 5, Follow God as children of the Lord. In Ephesians 6, since you're in the Lord, obey your parents. You see what he said? And so there's a lot of verses here talking about children and why you should do this job he's given you. Look at Ephesians 4, verse 14. Let me show you something here. <clears throat> the Bible says that, I'll erase this for a moment. <clears throat> when you're over here, you're a child. And there's a definition of that. It's not just because you're young. It's because you're lacking some things, okay? You were born in this world with nothing, and you're still kind of lacking some stuff. You're a child. When you get about 20 in this time here, this time period, the reason why you're supposed to learn things here is so that you can walk worthy of your vocation with the Lord, right? Colossians 1 verse 10 says, after you learn to walk worthy and be fruitful in the Lord and increase the knowledge of God, then you're able to be strong, and at this time in your life, between 40 and 60, is typically uh, where you're the most productive or strongest in your life in that you've already achieved many things. You're not too old, right, in life. You still have your physical body to do things, and yet at the same time you're not too young where you don't know things, and you're not just applying it. You are at this time in your life, and this is more for the adults, where you are equipped to do things. As a child, you're not equipped to do many things, so speaking to children. You're, there's things that you're not ready to do, right? We talk about groceries, buying groceries, and that's one thing, but there's many things. Ephesians 4 verse 14 says, God's will is that we henceforth be no more children. Did you know God's will for you children is that one day you would stop being children? That's what God wants for you. It's not God's design that you stay a child forever, and you won't. You will mature, and what will help you is if you grow in the Lord, Ephesians 4 verse 14 says, To be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, or by they lay in wait to deceive. Now Ephesians 4 14 paints a dark picture. It says that if you're a child, you are suspe uh, uh, you're susceptible to being deceived by people who want to trick you. Have, have your parents ever taught you about this? Where, you know, you can be deceived, you may not, you can't just trust strangers and go running around with everybody because you may not know what the real agenda is. Right? Ephesians 4.14 talks about we want you to not, no longer be children so that you're no longer falling over. Every child here knows how to walk. Is there any child here that's struggling walking? Your parents carried you in today. No, th that's the babies, right? The babies were carried out from the, by their parents. They had no control where they were going. My, my, my son is carried by Pam around. But you all can walk, right? You have legs and you're walking where you're going. To be no longer a child in one aspect means that you're able to stand on your own. That's what that means. You're able to stand. 
If you can do that, you're growing up. Praise God. The other thing is that you're able to stand with the Lord. That's what it means to grow up. And we talked about Jesus Christ, right? And what that means. You need to learn what that means to stand with the Lord so that you'll be strong in him. And the third thing in this verse says that you're able to withstand when people try to oppose you or try to knock you down or discourage you or try to tell you what is wrong or what's a lie, you're able to withstand those lies. That means stand against them, right? If you can do those things, if you can stand and then stand with the Lord and then stand against the wrong, then you are grown up, right? That's what that means. And so as a child, this is what you're supposed to be learning. You're learning how to grow up. Look at Ephesians 4, verse 15. It says you're supposed to speak the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. God's will for you children is to grow up in Christ. What's interesting is Paul wasn't talking only to children in Ephesians 4.15, right? Which means what? To your parents, he's also telling them, you guys need to grow up in Christ. Right? And to your grandparents, you guys need to grow up into Christ. You see, you're never finished growing up into Christ. But as children, that's what you need to do. You need to grow up. God says, grow up. Don't be a child forever. Because in the Bible, it says if you're a child, you're lacking things. You're lacking understanding. You're lacking responsibility. You're lacking the ability to help people. Right? If you say, well, I help people. Well, that's great. That means you're growing up. Right? But babies can't help anyone. Anybody have baby brothers and sisters? Yeah. Are they helpful around the house? They're sweeping the floors, right? Taking out the trash? No? Anybody has babies that are helping around the house? No? Is it sometimes it thinks, you think that your baby brothers and sisters are really more of a burden than a help? Anybody, anybody have baby brothers and sisters that wakes them up at night? Nobody. Well, yes. Thank you. Yes, my son wakes me up at night. He's a baby. Yeah, baby brothers and sisters that wake them up at night that seem to be really disrupting the peace at home. I mean, they're crying, throwing food on the floor. They can't even walk. They can't even, they don't even know where the toilet's at. Am I right? They don't even know where the toilet's at. You guys at least know this, I'm sure, right? You guys are growing up. This is great. And this is a, a very simple example, but this, this is what it means to grow up. Growing up doesn't mean that you are, how do I say it? It doesn't mean that you're just getting older. Because you can grow older and not take responsibility. Anybody ever seen a, a, an old person act like a child? Yeah. Uh -huh. It's funny sometimes, but only in the sense of, that's funny. I've never seen an adult wear a diaper. Right? That's a funny thing. Because adults aren't supposed to do that. They're not supposed to behave like children. Right? Because being a child means you're lacking responsibility, lacking understanding, you're foolish. You need to learn how to walk worthy of being in the Lord, right? Being, being uh, grown up doesn't mean you only get bigger. So who's the tallest child in the kids' class? Have you guys done this measurement? Bennett, are you, sort of? Well, you're kind of older, too. Yeah. Sometimes people think, well, when you get taller and you get bigger, this means you're growing up. And, and you are growing up physically, but it doesn't mean that you have understanding, does it? It doesn't mean you're learning anything just because you're taller. Sometimes you're taller than people who are the same age as you or taller than people that are, that are older than you. Right? It doesn't mean just that you're getting taller, but you will get taller. I know some adults that are as tall as some of you, or as short as some of you, right? But they're adults. So see, it doesn't, it doesn't depend on how tall you are. Being grown up doesn't mean also that you just get whatever you want. I said that earlier. I love being an adult because I can get whatever I want, but that's not what it means to being an adult, okay? A lot of children can get whatever they want, and they're just children, right? That's not what it means. What's the, what's the difference between being a child and being... A grown up. Let me just ask some questions here of you children to see how grown up you are. I've already asked whether you buy your own groceries, and I think she said she had a servant do it for her. But does, did any of the other children pay your bills? Do you guys know what bills are? Yes. You know that you know in your house it costs money to stay there, right? And uh, the, the electric, you all know like electricity, like plugging in your your devices and stuff. It costs money for this. And every time you eat food and throw it in the trash can and don't eat it, it costs money for that. You know that, right? And sometimes if you're in the city and you flush the toilet, every time it costs money to do that. Uh, it costs money for all these things, right? And nobody pays their bills? None of your children pay the bills? No. Why not? You don't like to. <laughs> you have some growing to do, son. Uh, does any adult like paying their bills? Nobody likes paying their bills. What happens if you don't pay your bills? 
you're homeless, you're starving. Remember, you're dead before you're 80. Right? That's how that works. You don't pay your bills. How about taxes? Do you guys even know what taxes are? No. Yeah. yeah, great. Do you do your taxes at home? Oh, well, that'd be helpful to your parents if you did your taxes. It may not work out too well for them, but... Anybody pay tax? Any adults? Anyone not? Well, I can't say it that way. <laughs> fifth Amendment, right? Claiming the fifth. What about, what about uh, doing laundry? Any children do laundry? Do your own laundry? Do you do your own laundry? That's great. You, sort of. Sometimes you can do it. You just don't choose not to do it. <laughs> you might do laundry. You guys do your own laundry? Sometimes you do laundry. Yeah. Well, this is great because you, you probably couldn't do laundry about six, seven, eight years ago, maybe. You probably couldn't do laundry so maybe five or six years ago. Couldn't do it. But your parents trust you to use the washing machine. Is that right? Yeah. They, no, not you. <laughs> like, no. Right. But some of you, they're trusting you to use the, the, the dryer. Maybe put stuff in the dryer, hit the button, and yeah, that's great. So they trust you to do it without blowing up the house. That's wonderful. That's a great responsibility because that means, you know, when you wear your clothes and get dirty, you can actually wash your clothes and you can do it on your own. You may not even need your parents to do your laundry if you can do your laundry, right? That's part of growing up, doing your laundry. What about fixing the house or the car? Do my cars break down? Nobody's cars break down, right? Anybody had it where their car's broken down? My car breaks down. Oh, you have new cars, right? New fancy cars. Yeah. Well, when your cars break, your houses break, when the plumbing breaks, you kids fix that, right? You should have. You, you guys have wrenches and hammers and you're all. No, do you guys know how to do that? No, not at all. Well, how's it going to be when you get your own car? Anybody want their own car? What's going to happen when your car breaks? Stay. Well, you got to get that money first. Remember, we talked about that. But when your car breaks, who's going to fix the thing? Yeah. You got to think about that. Do anybody make money? Does anybody make money? Yeah, you make some money? That's great. That's great. You get like investment fund, 401k, and that sort of thing. Saving up. That's good stuff. Making money. These are all responsibilities. That's why I'm asking this question. Responsibilities that accompany you being able to take care of yourself. Okay? What's it mean to grow up is this. There's two things. There's two things it means to grow up. One, it means that you're able to take care of yourself and other people. That's what we call responsibility, right? Take care of yourself and other people. And the second one is wisdom, which is learning how to make right choices. You see, the reason why the Bible says obey your parents is because your parents are over here. They're living their life, making choices, paying bills, knowing how to do things, and they know that when you grow older, you're going to make choices. And they want you to make the right choices. Any parent here do not want their children to make the right choices. I mean, this is, it, every parent in here wants their child to make right choices. The word that is defined as making right choices is wisdom. You've heard this word wisdom, right? So getting wisdom means I know how to make right choices. That's what that means. And being responsible means I know how to take care of myself and how to take care of others. That's what that means. And that's what it means to grow up. If you can take care of yourself and others and you can know how to make right choices, you, according to the scripture, you're growing up. I don't care if you're 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, you are mature, knowing how to take care of yourself and knowing how to make right choices. And so if your parents are teaching you how to make right choices, be obedient to them because they've probably been through some of those choices before, right? Or if they're teaching you how to take care of yourself, do the laundry, pay the bills, or read the scripture, pray to the Lord, right? They're doing this because they're teaching you how to take responsibility for your own life because you're going to die one day, right? You're going to have to teach yourself one day, right? So you need to take that responsibility. You know, in the Bible, there's some examples of this. Uh, Timothy who was a young man in 2 Timothy 1 verse 5, he learned from his mother and his grandmother to have faith. Anybody learn from their parents the gospel? Yeah, praise God for parents that they teach you the Bible and teach you about Jesus. Because Timothy, you know Timothy in the Bible, you know 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Timothy? He was a young man, and uh, he was probably younger than Jesus when he died. And he learned from his mother and his grandfather, our grandmother. And Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, verse 15, that from a child, Timothy knew the scriptures, which means children, you guys can know the Bible just like Timothy did. And it says the Bible is able to make you wise unto salvation. Now, remember, wise is how you make right choices, right? So it's how you make right choices to be saved, to live godly, right? That's what that means. <coughs> Timothy, do you know the story of Solomon? Look at 1 Kings chapter 3. Do you know where 1 Kings is at in the Bible? 1 Kings chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3. Solomon became a king 
when he thought he was still a child. He was about 20 years old, but that's right here on the, on the cusp, isn't it? He was about 20 years old, but his dad died when he was 20. In 1 Kings chapter 3, the Lord appeared to Solomon. In verse 7, Solomon says to the Lord, he's praying to God and says, Thou hast made thy servant king instead of David, my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. You see what he said? Solomon, he felt unprepared. He was the king of Israel, like the king. It was like you being the president of the United States. Anybody ready to be the president of the United States? Yeah, I know you want to be. Yeah. <laughs> the president's a big responsibility, right? A big country, and millions of people, and you are the executive of this country, right? He's the king of the nation of Israel, and he says, God, I'm not equipped for this. He says, I'm a little child. And he says in verse 8, Thy servant is in the midst of thy people which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered. There's too many people here. I can't take care of them all. I'm only 20 years old. He says, Give therefore thy servant understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge this so great among the people? And it says, The speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Solomon asked God not for more money and not, I want to be a king when I grow up because he was already a king. He said, I, Give me understanding. He had all the wealth in Israel. He had the, the, the job in Israel as the king. He said, give me wisdom. Give me understanding. And because he asked for that, God says, because you've asked for this thing, it pleased him. And he gave him wisdom and gave him wealth and gave him power and everything else. Okay? What I'm trying to say is that to, to be grown up, to grow up, means you need, to, you need to get wisdom. You need to get wisdom more than money. What do I want to be when I grow up? I want to be wise is what you should think. I want to understand things. Right? To know what God would have me do. To know what I should do to, uh, with other people. I remember when I was younger, there was a point where everyone, when I was younger, wanted to help people. Did any of the children here want to help people when they grow up? Very kind hearts. You all do, yeah. You want to help people. And there was one point you asked, what do you want to do when you grow up? And they said, I want to help people. That's all they said. And you said, how? I don't know. I want to help people. Well, you know what you need if, if you know that you want to help people and you don't know how to do it? You need wisdom. You need to understand how people need help and how you can help them. Solomon asked God for wisdom and he gave it to him. We can gain wisdom from the scriptures, as Paul told Timothy. The scriptures can make you wise. That's why you need the Bible. That's why we studied at church. Because it can give you wisdom beyond how old you are. Does anyone ever tell you that you're wise behind your, beyond your years? Anyone ever said that? <laughs> Rarely. It can happen when you read the scripture that you can get wisdom beyond your years, beyond how old you are. Okay. Solomon asked for wisdom. Look at Luke chapter 2. Do you know Jesus, um, when he was 12 years old, it gives you an example of what he was doing in his life. Anybody read this story about Jesus when he was 12 years old? Maybe 12 year olds here? I forgot. Did I, did I ask that? 12 year old? And Luke 2 is Jesus when he was 12 years old. Now I know you're not Jesus. You're not God in the flesh. But it is a good example and pattern as children of how they how they would, would work and how they should, what they should do. Luke 2, verse 40. It says, the child grew. This is talking about Jesus. The child Jesus grew and waxed strong in spirit. Wax means that he increased. He grew. He, filled, he was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. You need God's grace upon you and you need God's wisdom. In verse 41, his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the feast and they had fulfilled the days as they returned. The child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. So Mary and Joseph left, but Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. And look what he was doing. It says his mother did not know. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, they, went, they walked a day's journey. I don't know if anyone's calculated this. I don't know how long a day's journey is away from Jerusalem, but it's quite a distance. Okay? And they left their, their child Jesus back in Jerusalem. And it says in verse 46, they came back uh, to Jerusalem and it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. They were in the temple in Israel, which is where the, uh, the priests and the teachers were at, and he was sitting there listening to them and hearing them and then asking them questions. You say, I'm a child, what can I do in church? That's what you can do in church right there. You can hear and gain wisdom, and you can ask questions so that you can gain more wisdom, or maybe teach me something. Because I know a lot of times the questions that, that people ask here, they teach me something. Because you ask a question, I go, I never, I never thought about that. In fact, I forget who. Coraline, was it you? Someone years ago asked me if there were animals in heaven. Anyone had this question before? Kylie, do you know the answer if there's animals in heaven? You don't know? You mean veterinarian? 
I thought about this because someone asked me this. I thought I'd never had that question before. I, I never thought about it. I mean, animals in heaven, I, I don't know. But then I went to the Bible and I found that there actually are animals in heaven. You know this, right? There is. Uh, in Revelation chapter 19, when Jesus comes back to the earth, he comes from heaven and he's riding a horse. Where'd he get it? Not from the earth. Uh, apparently there's a horse in heaven, at least one. And there's a few of them up there. So apparently there's something like that in heaven. That's interesting, Revelation 19. But Luke 2, we have Jesus in the temple. He's answering or asking questions and he's hearing the teachers in the temple. In verse 47, it says, All that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. Now I know you all come out of kids' class and talk to your parents, because my dad tells me, Mr. J tells me, and you talk to your parents what you learn. And anytime your parents are like, wow, that's, that's amazing what you learn in the kids' class. Anybody said this? Yeah? Parents are going, yeah, that's amazing. Mr. J tells me these stories where he talks to your parents and they hear what you're learning in the class. And they go, the things that they can understand and hear and learn now is an amazing thing. And I think it's fascinating because Luke 2, the same thing that happened with Jesus. He was in the temple and he was talking and the, the priests are going, how does he know that? The difference is he was Jesus. But you can learn God's words from the Bible and you can have understanding more than many grown-ups. In fact, that makes you grown up to have understanding. In Luke chapter 2, verse 48, when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Why did you do this? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorry. And we were sad. We were crying. We didn't know where you were at. In verse 49, he said unto them, How is it that you sought me? Why did you look for me? Didn't you know where I would be? He says, Wouldst you know that I must be about my father's business? He, at 12 years old, he says, Didn't you know I would be doing what my father wanted me to do, which is in the temple and doing the will of the Lord? At 12 years old. He didn't have to wait until he was 20, 30, 40, 60, 80. He says, as, as a child, he's like, I'm going to do God's will. Right? He was the child of God, the son of God. And you are made sons of God. You are children that in the Lord, it says to obey your parents, to gain wisdom, to get responsibility. Right? What's it mean to be a Christian? Any child want to tell me what it, what it means? Does going to church make you a Christian? Yep. Um, does going to the movies make you a movie star? No. Does reading comic books make you a superhero? No. So does reading the Bible make you a Christian? <laughs> does reading a comic book make you a superhero? Does reading the Bible make you a Christian? No. Does, does going to class back there make you a Christian? No. What, what does it mean to be a Christian? Are, are you a Christian? Why are you a Christian? What makes you a Christian? Yeah, well, it's your quote in the gospel again. Yeah, at least you have an answer. Right, you're believing that Christ died on the cross for your sins. He rose from the dead, believing the gospel of Jesus, right? To be a Christian means that you know that when you grow up, as you live your life, you can't live without Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be a Christian, generally speaking, is that without Jesus Christ, you can't live, you can't walk, you can't grow, right? That's what it means. And so you're a sinner. You need Christ to save you from your sins so that you can have eternal life that you can live and you can walk and you can grow and live this life and love, joy, and peace. That's what you want to be as a Christian, right? That's what it means to be a Christian. You trust his work, his grace. If you think, well, I don't need Jesus, right? I don't need to learn how to grow in Jesus or grow in the Lord or walk in the Lord, then you don't need him, do you? But I'm warning you, that's a problem because God didn't intend life for that. He intended you to walk in the Lord, Okay. You trust Christ to grow, live, and walk. Now, the question that I want to end today with is, how do you grow up? You guys try to grow up? At night, you go home, you lay down in the bed, and you're going, grow. Does that happen? How do you grow up? Where do you get wisdom? Remember, I said growing up is getting wisdom, right? Where do you get it? Yeah, you guys know the answers. Who told you the answers? How do you get wisdom? Yeah. Yeah, can you get it anywhere else besides the Bible? Yeah, where? Sure, yeah. Yeah. But who are the closest people to you in your life? Yeah? God? Who else? Next to God? Yeah, Jesus? Next to Jesus? Your, your mom and your dad, maybe? You see them all the time? Your mom and dad are with you, right? Yeah? Yeah, your family. Yeah. The closest people to you, and that was the right answer. You can get wisdom from the Bible, but also from other people who have it, right? If they've read the Bible, if they learned it, they have it too, and they can tell you. And the people closest to you are your family. You see, God designed family to be a, a mother and a father, and then the children. Without the children, there's no family. It's just a marriage. But with the children there, so that the parents can help the children grow with wisdom. And so 
you can ask your parents about things and they'll teach you the wisdom of God. At least they're supposed to, right? Which means parents, you better know the wisdom of God, <laughs> right? And so you can get it from the Bible. If you say, I got bad parents, I got no parents, right? Well, you have the Bible. You can always get it from the Bible. God can teach you. He's the father of us all. But if you have a father, you have a mother, you can ask them for wisdom and they can teach you. The third way you'll get experience, and a lot of, a lot of adults know this by experience, is that you get it by life, right? As you get older and as you're faced with suffering and tribulation and circumstances and bad things and good things, you get experience. Romans 5 says, tribulation works patience and patience experience. So over time, 20 years from now, you'll be where your parents are sitting and you'll say, I've learned some things that I didn't know when I was a kid, right? Here's the problem with that is that's the hard way to learn. Adults, amen? It's the hard way to learn is to say, well, I'll learn it as I go. I'll just grow up and just make choices, and if it's a problem, then it'll just happen. That's the hard way. The easy way is to listen to your parents, to obey your parents, to read the scripture, to know what God wants you to do, and obey your parents and the Lord. That's the easy way. That's what God has told you to do. You see, he's given you the most profitable way. Okay? So you look for others to help you grow. It would be uncles, aunts, grandparents. In 1 Timothy 5, you can even learn from people who aren't your parents. And this is why we have church many times, is that there's people here trying to study God's word to grow in wisdom. In 1 Timothy 5, it says, treat the elders in your church as fathers, the elder men, and treat the elder women as mothers. You read those passages before? So you have your real father and mother. But what if, what if you, your father or mother is a bad mother or father? Well, hopefully you have family. Hopefully you have other people that are told to love you that can give you wisdom. Like we have elder men and elder women in the church who are taught to love God and to know God and can share wisdom as well. That's why we have teachers in your class, right? That's why we do this is try to help you grow up. Mr. J has told you many times in the big kids class, his goal is to have you prepared so you can be out here, right? And some of you have graduated, been in the class in the back, been out here. And the whole goal of that is not to say, well, you're, you're, not out, you're not an adult until you're out here or anything like that. It's simply to, to teach you wisdom that you need at the time of life that you're in, right? Because as you grow older, it's a different type of wisdom. It's a different type of responsibility that we're learning. But everybody's growing together in God's word. Look at Ephesians 6, verse 2. This is the last verse. Ephesians 6, verse 2. Paul's instruction is to obey your parents in the Lord. And then right after that, Paul says something else. He says, honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment. You know the commandments God gave to Moses? The, the first commandment with promise was honor your father and mother. That's the second thing he tells children to do. The first thing is obey your parents. The second thing is honor your parents. Does anyone know how to honor your parents? Yeah, what, yeah you respect, yeah? How do you honor your parents? Obey. Yeah, sure. Yeah, if you obey your parents, you're honoring them because they're your parents and you're obeying them. Why would you honor your parents? Yeah. Yeah, God tells you to. It's a very good reason. Ephesians 6 says, for this is right, right? But here, here's a good reason. Let me tell you. Is that when you were a child, and you still are a little bit, but you were even a younger child before you were a baby. When you were a baby, when you were a child, your parents gave you life, gave you food, gave you time, gave you effort from their life, right? They gave it to you, and they didn't require you to pay them for it, did they? They're not like, well, you got to pay me for that diaper I changed the other day, right? They, they didn't charge you for it. They gave it to you freely, and they gave it to you when you say, well, they're supposed to. Why are they supposed to? Because you couldn't help yourself, could you? When you were a baby, you couldn't do it on your own. Right? You couldn't feed yourself. You can't, if you don't know how to cook, you, anybody know how to cook as a child? Yeah, that's awesome. You cook your own food. Take care of yourself. But when you're a younger child, you don't yet know how to cook. And so you can't even cook. So they have to cook for you because you can't do it. So they give you things that you need that you couldn't get for yourself. Right? Who else did this? Didn't Jesus do something for you when you could not do it for yourself? You needed to die. You needed to pay for your sins. You needed to have eternal life. You needed to have wisdom. And Jesus says, I'll die on the cross for you. I know you can't do it. You're not perfect. And Christ did it. See, when Jesus died for you, he did it because you could not do that. And just like your parents, when they gave you things, it's because you couldn't do it. Right? So you honor your parents because they gave you things when you could not. How do you do that? You do it by saying thank you would be a first start. When was the last time you said thank you to your parents? 
Today? Yeah? Not today. Uh, <laughs> saying thank you to your parents is, is, parents love that. When children come to their parents and say, thank you for what you're doing for me. Because you know what that shows when you say thank you? Children, what's responsibility? It means to take care of yourself and consider other people, right? And when you say thank you, you're thinking about your parents and saying, I know what you're doing for me. Thank you. That shows you're growing up. That shows you're responsible, right? When you say, I love you, this is even greater. Parents love that, especially you know, when you get older. I love you. And that means because you appreciate them. You honor them. You know, there's not too many people that will be like your parents. In fact, I'll guarantee you that your parents are the only people guaranteed to be with you in the next 20, 30, 40 years throughout your life and every decision you make, no matter how you make it. Your parents will be there. You can't say it about other people. You may have friends now, and friends are great, but as you grow older, you get new friends and old friends go away. Your parents never change, right? Your brothers and sisters never change. And as you grow up and grow through life and you get married and have children and people start dying around you, your brothers and sisters and your parents will be around. They'll be there and you'll remember them. Honor your father and mother. Obey your parents because it will help you through your life. It'll help you grow up faster. It'll help you learn God's wisdom. Right? And it'll help you be a better grown-up. Help you get responsibility. Okay? Every parent wants their child to be a success. True or false, parents? It's not a parent that I met that's like, I want my child to be a bigger failure than I was. You know, uh, that doesn't really happen. They want you to be better than they were, right? And this is why, this is why God created you as well. He wanted, you to, he, he wanted to give you all of his glory and his grace and his joy. He wanted you to benefit from him, just like your parents want you to benefit from them, right? And even other adults who aren't parents of children here this morning, if a child here came up to you and asked you for wisdom about life, would you help them? Yeah. So you see, I know when you're young, it's kind of intimidating because there's adults and I don't want to feel embarrassed or look like a child, but you are a child. We know you're a child. And when you ask us for wisdom and for help or how, what's this mean in the Bible or what should I do in the situation, we love to help you. You see, you have access to much wisdom in the scripture and from people in your church that love you. Okay. So the last admonition here is to be excited for the Lord. When you're a child, Okay, adults are willing to help you. You have so much potential because you haven't done anything yet. <laughs> they want to help you, right? But that means you're able to be excited for the Lord and that your excitement, your zeal, when you tell people about the gospel, ad adults will listen to you. You guys help with the fairs, right? Some of you help with the fairs. You hand out tracts. What's well, amazing when you guys help with the fairs, I'd love it when you guys help with the fairs because every adult stops and looks at you and listens to what you say. And sometimes when I'm there, they don't like looking at me. My face isn't that pretty. You know, I stand there and I scare them and they run away. But when you're there, they listen to you. Adults will listen to a child because, hey, what do you have to tell me? This is going to be fun, right? And you tell them about the gospel. You can see adults saved by telling them what you, you tell them and give them tracts. You can help them know the truth. And when you're at home and your parents are struggling with all of the responsibilities they have, paying the bills and all that, when you tell them, thank you, uh, mom and dad, I love you, mom and dad, or helping them do things at home that they're responsible for, this can help them grow in the Lord. You can remind them to pray. Remind them you need to study the Bible every day. Remind them that you need to gain wisdom, right? And that will help them grow. You can help adults grow in the Lord. That's a big responsibility. Can you handle it? You're going to grow up, and the Bible has specific instructions for you to do that. It tells you how, okay? Don't forget to, how to grow up. Get wisdom from the Lord, okay? And it will profit you in your life. And like I said, you will have wisdom beyond how old you are. So you can be... 10, 11, 12, 8, 9, and 10, and have wisdom of a 40-year-old, have a wisdom of a 60-year-old. Wouldn't that be amazing? You'd be like a child genius, right? Adults will come to you and say, tell me the truth. <laughs> and you'll be able to tell them, because you know, that has happened before. It happened with Jesus, it happened with Solomon, it happened with Timothy, it happens with you, right? Amen? Let's pray. God, we thank you for every child here today. We thank you that you've given a family to each of us that we can grow in. We thank you for giving us your word that we can study to grow in wisdom. We thank you for the responsibilities you've given us as adults that we're able to achieve and succeed and influence and help people. And I pray that we would be charitable to others, helping them in their responsibilities, helping them to grow up in the Lord. And as we all are your children, we pray that we would be obedient to your instructions and your will so that we can receive the glory that you promised. Amen.